Welcome to Breathe California TV. Uh, this is a show that's been on for the last 30 years weekly. Uh, we call it Environmental Concerns. Breathe California is a lung health organization for the state of California. Uh, I'm on the board of directors for the um, Bay Area and Monterey Bay Area chapters. And um, today we'll be talking with Dan Halfley, who probably among citizens has done more than anything to uh, protect our oceans. Uh, we have some major anniversaries we're gonna be talking about. So um, stay with us. We'll be back in 30 seconds after this public service announcement. It's, it's given me a chance to go out and be with people who has the same problem. And uh, it's, it helps you to, uh, to manage your life better too because you hear different things from each person. And uh, it's just been really helpful in many ways. Welcome back. This is Breathe California TV. Breathe California is the lung health organization for the state of California. This show focuses more on prevention. My view of the health system we have in our country's biggest flaw is focus on treating people as opposed to trying to uh, educate us to prevent problems. We have a lot we can do to um, protect our health, particularly our lung health. So today our guest is Dan Halfley, um, very well known for his work as an oceans activist. Um, Dan, you've got a big uh, anniversary you're celebrating this year, the 50th anniversary. You wanna tell us about that? That's right. Uh, thank you, first of all, Terry, for having me on your show. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary turned 30 this year actually on September 18th was the 30th anniversary of its designation. And also this year, the National Marine Sanctuary System, that's 15 National Marine Sanctuaries in US waters, as well as two Marine National Monuments. That system is 50 years old. Uh, that system was kicked off with legislation back in 1972 to establish the Marine Sanctuaries Act. This was one of many bills, including the Clean, Clean Air Act, uh, which is very appropriate to the show, the Clean Water Act, the establishment of the EPA. These all happened in the wake of the disastrous 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. And the Marine Sanctuaries Act, the idea was to protect strategic areas of ocean for their, you know, to protect the resources and the environment, but also cultural resources to educate and to provide for ocean research, which is very important to lung health, very important to our atmosphere and the air we breathe, because of course the ocean provides 50% of the oxygen we breathe. It also creates weather and the ocean is where excess carbon that's produced as a result of climate change is absorbed, although the ocean is starting to react to that through ocean acidification. So. The Marine Sanctuary System nationally is 50 years old, thankfully today, under the Biden administration and some creative nonprofit leadership is really expanding. Uh, we're going to get a new Marine Sanctuary to the south of us. Monterey Bay Sanctuary extends from Marin County down to Northern San Luis Obispo County. There'll be a new Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, which will extend from the northern boundary of Monterey, uh, the southern boundary of Monterey Bay Sanctuary off of Cambria, San Luis Obispo County, all the way down to Point Conception in Santa Barbara County. That'll be the fifth, um, uh, the, the fifth in California National Marine Sanctuary and the sixth on the West Coast. And there are other marine sanctuaries that are on their way, many of them tribally nominated. So it's an anniversary uh, in two senses of the word. And it's also an opportunity for expansion so that we can protect our ocean and therefore protect ourselves. So nobody in the audience is gonna be able to read this, but I wanna put in a plug for your work. The United States 
Postal Service put out commemoratives celebrating the National Marine Sanctuaries. And it's the stamps that I've been using this year for, I, I know it's only people of your and my age that still use stamps, but That's right. uh, it's a wonderful um, attention builder for the program. I wish it's, the Marine Sanctuaries program got some money out of it, but I doubt it. Well, it's, it's a great uh, hallmark for us, a great milestone for us to get a stamp, as Secretary Leon Panetta said at the stamp ceremony, he says, wow, we got our own stamp. And we had the governor of the Postal Service there. It was wonderful. And uh, yes, um, people of a certain age remember putting stamps on envelopes. In fact, the campaign to get Monterey Bay Sanctuary established happened well before the internet uh, was in common use. And one of the ways that we reached uh, the public and in order to rally people in support of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary and its largest boundary, uh, the time to fight offshore oil was to the U.S. Postal Service. We sent out, you know, something called an action alert. It was on something called paper, which had printing on the paper. <laughs> and we put a stamp on it, a nonprofit stamp. And we took it down to a thing called the post office and People in the Postal Service delivered these to mailboxes of individuals who then opened them and took action and used old fashioned telephones or then wrote letters to their government officials, put stamps on those and sent them back. So it's actually very fitting that um, Monterey Bay Sanctuary has its own stamp. So uh, I'm gonna do some self puffery here. Um, you and I were talking off air that uh, the ocean also is San Francisco Bay, uh, and um, this is the 50th anniversary of the um, selection of the San Francisco Golden Gate National Re uh, Recreation Area, and Absolutely. I carried the Santa Clara County effort to get what is now called the Don Edwards, is that a wildlife refuge? Yes. added to that um, program and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary there as well so our our listeners in san jose and campbell ought to be just as uh, proud as our santa cruz county over and don time. edwards was a great member of congress from santa clara county as well and it's well deserved that his name is on that the golden gate recreation area it's all part of today, it's part of the 30 by 30 effort to by 2030 have 30% of our lands and ocean be in protected status. And the Bay Area is far, far ahead as it was 50 years ago when you established that. So thank you. So you did a good job of introducing the importance of our oceans to our air quality. Um, I would like to see if maybe there was some way to expand on that. Um, the uh, climate change issue, there's a lot of people that worry about carbon. Uh, maybe it's all because of their, what is it, carbonic acid? What's the, the name of the acid of carbon and water together? That's right, there's a complex chemical process which we won't go through the uh, formula here, but basically when there's excess carbon in the atmosphere, as well as some other greenhouse gases, they uh, dissolve in the ocean. Uh, there's a, uh, there is a uh, chemical change that's under, undergone and the pH changes ever so slightly, but enough to notice. And this is an effect of climate change. It's called ocean acidification. It's actually, uh, moving the base, the scale of the base level of the ocean a little bit further towards the middle. And uh, it's not a good trend. And also we've had a problem with less oxygen in the ocean, particularly along parts of the Pacific, uh, the Pacific coast here. So these are concerning trends. And one of the things that National Marine Sanctuaries do is see if they can work with researchers to find ways to combat this. Uh, and part of this is to, for example, to bulk, bulk up our kelp forests, which absorb excess carbon as well, and uh, also buffer the coast 
from erosion because kelp really dampens the wave action. Surfers may not like that, but it does help our coastline. And uh, there's been an effort in California to plant seagrass in certain areas to restore wetlands in order to um, basically bulk up the health of the ocean and the estuaries and the waterways that flow to it. And this will then help the atmosphere. It will also help the land, also make sure that there's less pollution from land, less nutrient rich pollution, less plastic pollution. And this will help uh, protect the ocean so that the ocean can be a better ally to us in this effort to fight climate change and to provide all that oxygen that we breathe. Well, you've mentioned wetlands and um, the 24 years that I acted as an environmental professor at local universities, um, I tried to highlight what is a well-known fact among scientists, which is the most um, productive area of the planet are our wetlands. That's and, right. And uh, given that uh, I should be letting you do more of the talking, but plants are where we're getting our oxygen from and they're pulling carbon out of the air. Um, and there's some other advantages as well. I saw a study that um, the flooding in Houston, I'm trying to remember the earthquake that that was, was four times as bad because Houston had filled in all of their wetlands and they mm -hmm. lost the, the capacity there to uh, reduce the damage, just like you were talking about with kelp in the ocean. Exactly. And then with Louisiana, New Orleans, Cajun country, all the areas there that have hurricane activity, uh, many of the wetlands have been diminished or destroyed in that area and that those wetlands play a role in buffering storm action as well as wave action and storm surge. Uh, so this is very, very important. The more plants we can, we can produce and the healthier the ocean is, the healthier these rainforests are and wetlands, the better off we are. In fact, when I mentioned that half of our, uh, our oxygen comes from the ocean, that's largely from uh, phytoplankton which are plant life and tiny plant life drifters in the ocean. So uh, plant life is vital. Uh, tr planting trees is vital. Wetland areas are vital. So it's a little bit early, but I think we'll take a break now. And uh, then I want to talk to you about a couple of UN studies that um, are none too optimistic about the future of our reliance on ocean. So um, we're going to take a 30 second break for uh, an announcement from Breathe California, and we'll be back uh, with Dan at the end of that. The different therapeutic methods that we can help our um, very low socioeconomic status um, clients who have no alternatives, no, no anything, and they, they're still about 15 different resources we got out of this that if you have no resources, no service connection, you can still get aid. That they are connected, one encourages the other, and that the process of change from backing off from the tobacco is the same as backing off from any other addictive drug. Everyone can benefit from this training that we just were offered today. I would not take it back. Welcome back. I'm Terry Trumbull. I'm a volunteer for Breathe California. If you want to help uh, get our air cleaned up, uh, I would urge you to um, look at the website under my name, um, which also has some past shows on it. And uh, if you want to volunteer, give a call to 408-998-5865. They really could use your help in a wide variety of things like Dan and I've been working on for years. So uh, back to uh, Dan Halfley, uh, oceans activist. Um, I cited when I was teaching a 2008 UN study that said in 40 years, that is 2048, if we don't change our behavior, there isn't any food left in the ocean. And they weren't talking just about fish. 
but it was the ability to convert things like, I'm not sure kelp is edible, but uh, there's all sorts of plant opportunities in food in the ocean. Um, do you think uh, the last 14 years, those trends have gotten any better? I don't think the trends have gotten any better. We have done a good job with the marine sanctuary system in protecting these areas. And I'd say in the last two years, there have been some great initiatives in the United States and throughout the world to make our oceans healthier and improve food production in the ocean, including fisheries. But the overall trend right now is not a good one. You still have overfishing you st uh, worldwide. You still have acidification. You still have ocean pollution, which is a severe problem. The plastic ocean pollution problem is not to be underestimated. And the worst part of that, I mean, it's not just the 1.25 trillion, but the 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean. It's the microplastics, the stuff that will never come up with any kind of ocean cleanup effort. So we have to almost immediately reduce and eliminate our use of plastics. We need to reduce our car carbon footprint. We need to um, be very careful about what we eat and be very careful about uh, what we put into the ocean in terms of nutrient rich uh, runoff uh, from agriculture and from urban areas, as well as plastic pollution. Um, so uh, I think that we are not any better off than we were back in 2008 when that study was published. However, I'm optimistic about the future. I think now more people are aware in the United States. I think around the world, people have been aware for a while, particularly island nations uh, and particularly countries that are uh, more victimized uh, more early than, uh, by climate change than we are in this country. So I think that if we keep that trend going, that's, that's good. And also as younger people take over, I think younger people absolutely understand that climate change is an issue. For them, it's not a debate whether there is climate change. They understand that it's there and they're pretty annoyed that we haven't done anything about it over the past 30 or 40 years. So uh, they're gonna see it as time to get to work. So that's a reason for optimism as well. Uh, talk a little bit about why marine sanctuaries are good for the ocean. So could you describe um, good things they do and some that they don't? I've got at least one of my, mine that I am just disappointed about. Okay, so marine sanctuaries, you know, the Marine Sanctuaries Act is really the same act that it was 50 years ago. And part of that is it's been difficult to get positive changes in the current political climate in Congress. Um, one of the things that marine sanctuaries do, and it's very little, it's not well known, is the fact that there's robust research that goes on. And uh, Monterey Bay Sanctuary, I'll use that as an example since it's close by, is they've been doing a lot of work with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is a powerhouse research institute in Moss Landing. And they do a lot of deep sea ocean work. Uh, brainchild of David Packard, um, who was a Silicon Valley great for many years. And he invested his legacy uh, in that institution as well as the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So one good example for, uh, is uh, they did a pilot project on replanting a uh, hundred of of coral species on Sur Ridge, which is below Big Sur, uh, about, I believe, 3,000 feet of water and replanting these corals. These corals are a couple hundred years old or older in each case. Uh, the more that you're able to replant those, uh, the more you're able to establish that plant life that we talked about earlier in the ocean. Uh, another thing that's been done is eDNA. So, um, Mabari is able to take a snapshot in each cubic uh, uh, unit of ocean uh, by looking at the DNA that's left behind by various species that pass by. They leave bits of skin or gel gelatinous material and you're able to tell what's been there and this will help you map what species are there, who is passing by this particular piece of ocean, and that helps establish a baseline from which you can establish better health for the ocean. Also education. This is where younger people are able to get the tools 
to um, be able to effectively work to halt climate change and protect the ocean. And there's great programs in Monterey Bay like O'Neill Sea Odyssey, which helps elementary school students save our shores. Watsonville Wetlands Watch, which focus on wetlands and focus on the area at, in the middle of Monterey Bay around Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley. Students there uh, so they can protect those wetlands, which are so important to the ocean, so important to the atmosphere. So these are things that marine sanctuaries encourage and are able to do. Another thing Monterey Bay Sanctuary does, and this is little known, is if a vessel breaks up and poses a threat to the environment, either oil spills or cracking up uh, in a um, uh, up where there are tide pools, for example, the sanctuary staff uh, are immediately there and they work to respond to prevent uh, a disaster for the natural resources that are there. And uh, this is hard work. Um, we're trying to get more money so that they can actually do this work, especially if the boat owner does not have the funds to help pay for this work. These may seem like little things, but if you add these up across a system that has 17 sites now and is rapidly expanding, um, then you have uh, more opportunities uh, for better ocean protection. Another area that is due for ocean protection, and they are on a candidate list, is the Marianas Trench one of the deepest, uh, the deepest part of the ocean. So um, all what, of this what's is- the, Is there a US connection there? Is it close, close enough to Guam or something? Yes, yes, there's some islands there that are close by. And uh, the important part of this also is that you have a variety of different types of environments. You have coral environment, tropical coral environments. You have colder kelp based environments. Uh, colder waters such as here, you have Great Lakes environments. There's a couple of new um, sanctuaries established in the Great Lakes region. So you're able to get a sampling. And, you know, it's a small percentage of U.S. waters, which are a small percentage of, 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 of waters around the world. But once you can show that this works, you could start establish the, establishing these around the world. Um, there are areas for improvement, for example, the dumping treaties that exist that are out there. If somebody is far out in the ocean and there's no enforcement, there's nobody to stop somebody from dumping their garbage overboard or hazardous materials overboard. Uh, this is an area where greater international cooperation can improve this as you know, our response to incidents like this as well, as, especially with increasing technology. So you mentioned one of our big threats is uh, to the ocean, particularly food, is overfishing. Is that yes. is fishing, commercial fishing allowed in marine sanctuaries? It is in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. But keep in mind that uh, fishing in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary or in Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, just to the north of Monterey Bay, that those fisheries are already pretty heavily regulated by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and also the National Marine Fisheries Service. We have the Magnuson Fisheries Act, which establishes some very, uh, some pretty good um, uh, rules on fishing, on take, on use of gear. Uh, you know, people do eat seafood. And um, the heartening thing for me is you have a younger generation of fishers who are focusing on niche markets where uh, the health of the fisheries are important to those consumers. Um, so yes, you, the commercial fishing is allowed in some areas. I'd say the overfishing worldwide comes from the large factory type operations that you see going on, for example, right around the edges of the Galapagos Islands Marine Reserve. For example, you have <clears throat> overfishing that goes on. You have manta rays at risk because of the bycatch from some of those fisheries. Um, and this is a matter of education. For, for a second, stop and explain bycatch. Bycatch is when you're using a net uh, or you're fishing by some other method and you catch a species other than your target species, the species that you were depending upon. Um, so for example, you know, uh, uh, dolphins were, were bycatch in, uh, off of California and um, some good legislative work and some cooperation with the fishing community was able to reduce that. 
So bycatch is always a problem. And uh, the more we're able to reduce it, the better off those species are. Therefore, the better off we are. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about discharge of sewage in yeah. the ocean. I would assume that's part of the contamination issues you worried about. Yes. 30 years ago, I successfully sued the uh, city of Santa Cruz for dumping raw and treated sewage into the ocean. My client for that was the Surfrider Foundation, a wonderful group for being out to try to protect the ocean waters. Um, so is that, I assume that you couldn't have passed a marine sanctuaries law if you did prohibit dumping of treated sewage. That's right, Marine, the uh, National Marine Sanctuary that covers the Santa Cruz area and that outfall that you're referring to, and thank you for your work on that, is now uh, the, treat, the treatment of that sewage is at an advanced primary, uh, excuse me, advanced secondary level, not quite tertiary level, but you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary, that's, that's increasing levels of purity of the water. And so that your work made that possible, I believe, uh, for the city of Santa Cruz to be able to comply with the Marine Sanctuaries Act. The city of Watsonville, their discharges are at a tertiary level, I believe. Uh, we still have problems. For example, a couple of years ago, one of the cities on the Monterey Peninsula uh, discharged a large amount of raw sewage. Uh, it was an accident, but it was a very large amount. And uh, the sanctuary office enforcement officer was able to work with that city and come up with a hefty fine and um, they're still working with them to uh, uh, undertake restitution a lot of damage was probably done as a result of that but uh, what we're talking about here is, is is sewage that comes through the sanitary sewer system which is one type of discharge in the sanctuary another type of discharge in the sanctuary um, are those items that do not go through the sanitary sewer. For example, through our storm drains, through our rivers, you'll get trash, you'll get um, uh, fertilizers, which is uh, bring nutrients to the ocean. You'll get plastic pollution. This is what's called non-point source pollution. And this also has to be reduced um, through efforts that involve education of the general public so that they can clean up uh, what's left behind them, for example, people cleaning up uh, uh, what their pets do when their pets have to relieve themselves. They're able to uh, pick that up and put that into a trash can, which so, then... Dan, I apologize for interrupting you, but we're pretty much out of time at this point. Oh, sorry. You've got about, say, 15 seconds if you have some wonderful wrap-up message for us. Sure. Um, so to support Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, uh, just go to montereybayfoundation.org. If you're interested in National Marine Sanctuaries as a system, uh, you can go to Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Uh, .org. That's the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Another good website is saveourshores.org for coastal cleanups um, to help keep our ocean clean. So thank you for having me. And thank you for all of your uh, work and everybody should know there's a lot more left to do. Absolutely.